Hi, Filmatics. Welcome back to part two with Brendan Foley, an award-winning writer and showrunner. Um, he is in some, he's producing some great TV shows that I'm so excited to tell you about. Um, one of them is called Cold Courage. His best-selling book, Under the Wire, about a great escape. And we were talking about Johnny Was, where I want to ask you, Brendan, welcome back, Brendan. Thanks for part two. Great to be back. Yeah. And so um, can you just tell us, you know, you have the who. So, you know, if I didn't ask you, people were like, well, why didn't she ask him? Like, how did you get Roger Daltrey of the who and Leonard Lennox um, in your first movie? It was your first directing debut? Yeah, it was. It was the first, both first uh, writing feature. I just made a few shorts before then. Um, and uh, first as a lead producer, uh, which... You know, I'm sure I made every mistake in the book along the way, and uh, certainly it's not. Uh, if there are such things as get get rich quick schemes, a lot of indie movies are get poor quick schemes. <laughs> so it has to be done out of some kind of passion. Um, it sort of goes back to uh, what I was saying earlier. You have to write something that's just fresh and different and knocks people on the rear end. So. When when I first came to LA, even though it was it was a story set in with you know black and white characters in in Brixton in London and sort of Irish characters and so on, so it was pretty esoteric when you're pitching Hollywood with something like that. But even then, there were a couple of offers to make it there, but for whatever reason, you know, things come and go and don't work out, and you can. You know, LA is the only place in the world where you can die from encouragement. Uh, and <laughs> or non-encouragement. So fin <laughs> yeah. Finally, I, uh, I thought, well, you know, I, I'd, I'd done quite a lot of business journalism at one time and another, and I thought, well, I sort of know my way around the basics of let's, you know, let's put a show on in the barn. So I, uh, I started with a good script, and I knew that the funding would follow good actors and there is always this sort of uh, I don't know what you'd call it sort of vicious circle that uh, actors agents don't want their clients to read in case they fall in love with something unless there's a big juicy check attached to uh, you know a, a pay or play offer that if if my if you use my client's name then even if you haven't made the movie at the end of a year you still have to give them a large bag of money for for having taken their name in vain and that's you know that's always going to be a problem but by by hook or crook you can you can sometimes meet people for whom money isn't the prime mover so in this case for instance uh you know i'm sure lennox lewis having become world champion was not down to his his uh you know last few dollars so actually what he would be being paid for a movie would be much less important than someone giving him a really great role uh and he wasn't you know he wasn't an actor he's a boxer so he needed all the support and encouragement but he did a great bang up job in it in the end uh, because he was used to performing in front of millions of people in uh a uh a, a you know, scenario where someone was trying to knock his head off, which is much worse than the average uh, indie movie. And there is one uh, anecdote I need to tell from that point. So on one of his first days in set, on set, uh, uh, Lennox, and, uh, he, he's, he's a big, big guy, you know, heavyweight champ, and uh, has hands the size of shovels. And so he was on set, and it was a simple scene where he had to come into a house there was a, a gangster unconscious on the floor and he had to lift him and slap him around a bit and then say, where have you hidden the guns? And the gangster wouldn't tell him, so he had to rough him up a bit more until he did tell him. So the first take, he uh, went in and I don't think anyone had bothered to tell him that it was acting, so you didn't need to be, you know, you, you weren't going in against uh, a <laughs> world heavyweight contender, so the other actor was dozing quietly, pretending to be unconscious. And Lennox lifted him with these enormous hands and bounced him a bit and said, where have you hidden the guns? And the guy opened his eyes in total terror and said, they're in the cupboard. <laughs> About 
two seconds later. But the look of complete terror that he was about to be annihilated by the world heavyweight champ was actually better than what we'd written. So we, we did it in one take. So on the other hand, you have uh, um, someone like Roger Daltrey and uh, it was a while ago now, but from memory, he was coming off his, his immediate gig before that was uh, uh, Live Aid, the, uh, the enormous charity Live gig. Aid. Where they, I think they played in front of like 1.4 billion people and suddenly this guy was in uh, a little, you know, so a, a, a disused shipyard in Belfast shooting an indie movie with a crew of maybe 75 and uh, surprisingly enough, he was he was quite he was brilliant, but he was quite nervous at the start doing that. And uh, you know, I felt like saying to him, "You were just on stage in front of 1.4 billion." And he just said, "That's different, isn't it?" Mm. So uh, I I sort of sympathised with that. But he he gave to my mind one of the best, most menacing performances in in the movie, and it was all held together by Vinnie Jones who did it because he wanted a chance to be a real lead and to show that he could act. He just, he could do more than just look menacing, which he does brilliantly, incidentally. Uh, uh, because Vin Vinny's resting face says, I will kill you. <laughs> he's actually a really, he's a great, great guy. But uh, if, if he's just sort of staring at you, you do think that you're about to be thrown out a window. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, we, we got on very well. And I've worked with him actually on three features uh, in all. And he he's he always brought his A game. So for him, that was the most important thing, uh, having a script that just gave him a chance to shine. For Lennox Lewis, it was a chance to do something different from boxing. And he actually, Brave Soul, he had his honeymoon in Belfast while we were shooting Johnny Was. Oh, so wow. that was a turnout for the books. That's commitment uh, to an acting role. That just shows you some yeah, people love yeah. the art so much that they will commit. Um, you know. Yeah. So it's it's not always. I suppose bottom line of it is it's it's not always about money. But if it's about something else, if it's about a good script or a great role, then you you better bring your A game as a, a writer, a producer, or a director to that because they're not going to say. You know, yes, thank you. I, I've been waiting all my life to do a sort of run of the mill indie movie when I'm paid 10 times as much by a studio. So give them something special, is the bottom line. And, and, uh, and uh, Brendan Foley, you gave them something special. It's a testament that your first film you had attracted like worldwide, like iconic people. To your you, to your film, so I want to ask you: Do you want to share your next film that you want to talk about? Or... Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll touch on the, uh, the the next thing I did of, of any scale uh, was another indie movie, which was shooting in London, uh, a sort of supernatural murder mystery, and it, Vinny was in that as well. But also uh, Derek Jacobi and Vanessa Redgrave. So we had two members of acting royalty. Uh, in that and that's another good example of you know, why do actors do something uh, Derek did that firstly because he loved the writing and secondly because he got to play two totally different characters in one movie and one is a present day tramp who's beach coming along the River Thames foreshore and the other one is Charles Dickens. Uh, the, the basic plot is that someone discovers what seems to be an unpublished novel by Charles Dickens, which is worth millions. And there's a series of murders that follow its discovery. Uh, so, so for him, it was really interesting playing two different characters in one movie, which has been done, you know, a lot since then and sometimes before then. Um, and he loved Charles Dickens and he loved the dialogue. So he got to, to read out sort of a, uh, like a reinvented imaginary Dickens novel in, in part of it. And he loved that. So, so everyone has different reasons for doing so. But uh, I know one of the things we talked about a bit earlier was uh, sort of any crazy stuff that happens on set. And the closer you are to sort of fly by the seat of your pants, indie movie making the more things like that happen but i recall vividly we were so grateful to have you know someone of the standing of sir derek jacoby just amazing actor in this role 
and when we were getting ready for a night shoot along the River Thames. And we didn't have enough money to redo things endlessly. So it was a few takes and you were out and you had to get it in that time scale. So when we were preparing and we had a maybe a crew of 70 or 100 and uh, uh, with so it was a fairly sizable even nighttime shoot. And so we had all our lights and the great Thames foreshore and sort of Dickensian in London as our backdrop. And this uh, little man who... Uh, lived locally sidled up to me and i said oh, hello can i help you and he said uh he said you're lowering the tone i said sorry i beg your pardon he said you're lowering the tone of the neighborhood with your movie i said oh sorry we're just making a little movie and you know we're not bothering anyone and we have all our permits and he said you're attracting the wrong sort of people here and so he pointed over at our craft services table and said, look over there, there's a tramp helping himself to your food. <laughs> and I said, I had to say, well, that's actually Sir Derek Jacobi in costume playing a tramp, and he's just having a little snack. <laughs> and I went, oh, okay, and sidled off again. But you get, you know, you get a lot of that when you're, uh, when you're on location. And it sounded uh, so English, the way he spoke to you. You were lowering yes. the tone, like so proper, yeah, like, he, oh, you're lowering the tone was, of the neighborhood. Was, well, it don't was come a genuine article. Angels. It was very Monty Python. So, uh, okay. so a lot of stuff like that happens. Um, and I, I'd say for a lot of people aspiring to make indie movies, it's the only thing that I, I don't want to be Debbie Downer here, but making indie movies is a passion. It's it's just not a business. It's not, it's not a sustainable business model at all. So there's a thousand people trying to do it for every person succeeding in it. Uh, and the budgets are very, very difficult to get unless you have some name actors in there. And if you have a tiny budget, it's harder and harder to have name actors or or to get past agents. So, and I don't blame agents because their job is to, you know, to make money while their clients make money. So uh, they see a lot of little indie movies as serious detours from their main role in life but um, also that indie movie could re you know like re-energize their career to stretch their bones where they can be seen in a different light in a challenging role and even win um oscars and awards for these amazing because some of these independent people talent is incredible and, and it's like so many people have talent and only a few make it so it's that's yeah, yeah, it's, and, and that's absolutely right And that you could list half a dozen actors who have completely re-energized their career by taking a risk and doing something daring, which wasn't all about the money. Um, but at the same time, as uh, I'm not here to defend agents, but if your job is to maximize your client's income and your clients can make five times as much money in one day doing an advert for baked beans, or can be out of the game for five weeks doing an indie movie, which with the best will in the world is unlikely to have enough budget to market itself or get seen, then it's, you know, it, it's a, a brave agent who says, you know, go for it, it's a great script. And there are some like that, hats off to them. But, but from the other side, there's a very, you know, an, an old joke, which is that the, the key skill for being an agent is the ability to divide by 10. Which means that they're always calculating what they're getting out of it. Too. But you know, I, I actually am inclined to defend some agents because they they do a very good job of trying to let their client do what they want to do while guiding them to make sure they don't lose their shirt. So it's not not an easy job. Yeah, and like right now, everyone you know is ready to work because of COVID, and um. So, so I wanted to ask you: Do you want to share another movie, or do you want to talk about a TV show or a book? Because you have so many great things. So, I'm going to let you decide which. Oh, one. thank, thank you. Um, I suppose just to stop for one second in Bookland because I, uh, when I was getting wearied with uh, how long it was taking me to make each indie movie, it might be sort of six years worth of slogging away uh, to make one movie, and at the end of that you had maybe a 10% chance of, you know, making, making your money or time back. So that's, it really is a labor of love rather than a, a 
sort of sensible way of sort of making a living. So I was uh, drawn into, because I'd been a journalist for many, many years, I uh, was drawn into the idea of writing a, a book because every every journalist thinks they have a book in them, whether they do or not. And for some of us, that's where they should stay inside. But uh, in this case, I had an old friend. This does actually relate back to movie land. I had an old friend called Bill Ash, who I knew through the Writers Guild in Britain. And Bill was, the easiest way to describe him is he's an old Texan who was a Spitfire pilot during World War II. Uh, but he was also believed to be one of the inspirations for the character played by Steve McQueen in the movie The Great Escape, which was about the biggest jailbreak from a POW camp in Germany during the war. And uh, The Great Escape, I think 1963, amazing movie. But anyway, uh, Bill was basically the real deal. He had done all of these things, and he was a sort of wild-eyed revolutionary of the, the sort who you would have imagined would have fought in the Spanish Civil War, but he fought in World War II. Sort of very, very political, very feisty. Even he, he lived to be 96, and he was like a second father to me. So I wrote his life story, which uh, I originally set out to, to get it made as a, a movie and then as a TV series. I was sort of banging my head against the brick wall. So I thought in the meantime, well, I actually have, you know, I've, I've done all the research, so I'll write it as a book. And I was very fortunate because I had a, a, a great agent, Robert Kirby, who took an interest when he didn't have to. And uh, he took it out and it sold to uh, Random House Trans World Random House, and if you have a big name like that behind something, it can really push it. So it was one of the most exciting times of my life when we were doing the the press for it, uh, and it was just when sort of Amazon was coming to the fore. And while we were doing an interview with the BBC, I had the the Amazon page open, and I could see it climbing in the charts and the sales in real time every time I refreshed. So that made me think a lot about the power of the press and success or failure. And Bill was delighted because it was the first time anyone had paid much attention to him since World War II. And uh, he was just delighted at all the, the book launches and the razzmatazz. So because of that success, then a lot of the people who had been turning me down on the film and uh, um, TV series from suddenly came back and said, oh, that's a really interesting book. Have you ever thought of turning it into a movie? <laughs> I said, no, it never, never occurred to me. So uh, we're, we're talking to people now about uh, the possibility of, uh, of it being a, uh, a mini series, oh, um, which beautiful. is great. But ju just to say again, for, for people who are sort of thinking, well, how the hell do I get a, some kind of handhold in this industry? Sometimes you have to take a detour and have some patience to to find a way of attracting that attention. And it, you know, it could have been that if if a big publisher had turned it down, the same book would have gone to a little publisher and sold. You know, I don't know how many it sold now, maybe three hundred thousand copies. But it it could have gone to a little publisher and sold thirty thousand copies if I was lucky, or three thousand copies. So there's a big element of luck in all of this. And it, it's just like one phone call can make the difference. Uh, as they say, one minute you're a rooster, the next minute you're a feather duster. Mm -hmm. So just take advantage of it when when it does come. Oh. And just just to sort of finish the thought, there's uh, there's no saying that says that uh, luck is where preparation meets opportunity. And I think that's incredibly true in the, the film and TV world. So you have to be ready. You have to have really honed your skills. Um, you know, don't expect it to happen overnight. Uh, some of the best writers I know are 20-year like or 30-year overnight successes. Uh, and, and you can actually learn from those mistakes and um, do that time. Uh, I, I think like the, the uh, Black Young and the actor in uh, uh, Better Call Saul, but I saw an interview recently where he said, I, I don't go in f to interviews, Bob Odenkirk, uh, I don't go into interviews, uh, not interviews, uh, uh, auditions expecting to get the job. I just think 
I'm going to do the best performance I can. And that's an end in itself, just me going in and doing the best performance. And if a job comes out of it, that's amazing. And if it doesn't, I've done what I went to do. And I thought that was such a healthy attitude to uh, uh, to have. And obviously, you have to pay the bills along the way. But I think actors are used to being sort of heroic at making ends meet while I give it a shot. <laughs> and you know, unfortunately, there's always going to be more people giving it a shot than succeeding. But at least I have tremendous admiration for anyone who tries. Because at least you know, at least you tried. It wasn't. It wasn't like you sort of sat and pretended or thought, "Wouldn't it be nice to do?" Like all the people who think about writing a script but never quite get around to it. You know, I'd, I have more respect for anyone who wrote the worst script in the world than someone who thought about writing the best one but didn't quite get around to it. Yeah, and I, I have to just say, you know, um, Brendan, the luck of the Irish is with you because yeah, you do like, a book. And it gets picked up at Random House and it becomes a bestseller. And now finally with that, um, it's getting some traction. And can you say it again? Yeah. It's it's called Under the I want Under to, the Wire. Under so, the Wire. And they can get it on Amazon or Random House. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's available in around the world, uh, both in print and uh, online. And it's about that, that great escape with your friends. So it's, it's, it's basically about uh, about this larger than life American who it was basically he was like roadrunner on European tour, escaping from he escaped thirteen times from the Nazis across but, Europe on his yes. own unauthorized tour. So it's yes. it's actually funnier than it's harrowing, but it's quite funny. He escaped life. thirteen times, man. He had some luck of the Irish too. Can you just? Yeah. What, I mean, wow, what the tenacity and the yeah. focus yeah. of him. I mean, he was uh, at one point. He was uh, when he was recaptured. He uh, once was put on trial for his life by the Gestapo, and he said, "You can't shoot me. I'm a prisoner of war." protected by the Geneva Convention. And the Gestapo says, ah, but we don't think you're a real prisoner of war because we have this map of where you've escaped from and no one can have escaped that often who is just a normal prisoner of war. So we suspect that you are a professional escapologist, probably from a circus, who was parachuted in to train the others and run around Europe. <laughs> and Bill, in Bill's defense, he said, didn't it ever strike you that I might just be very good at escaping, but terrible at getting away? <laughs> so uh, that was why he wasn't shot. So it's it's a fun, it's a fun read. I, I miss him. I miss that sort of, it was just such a larger than life generation. Who, uh, I think once you had been through those events in wartime, you know, nothing frightened you anymore. And you weren't, you weren't too afraid of walking on the grass because... You thought, well, what, you know, what can you do to me? You can't shoot me. Oh, wow. Well, so, uh, that's, yeah, that was fun. So anyway, it was a little sort of segue into into the land of books. I've written a few others. But uh, from that, I, I'm, I've just been incredibly happy segueing into TV, just being very lucky, just coming into it with a, you know, enough track record to, to have a bit of traction while the industry is booming and the streamers are so hungry for good content that uh, they'll they'll give more you know they'll give you a, a second glance to it, it's never going to be easy but at least now there is there's just more volume that needs to be filled so there's more development and more production coming from that so it's it's actually quite a good time to, for people who are trying to break in that you you'll get a you get a second look where maybe in five years' time you wouldn't because it, the industry will formalize itself again and have more gatekeepers trying to keep these pesky writers and directors at bay and on the outside. So if you're going to do it, now's a good time. And and which speaking of, so your TV show, can you talk about the Cold, the cold yeah, Courage? Sure, yeah, sure. And also cold, again, cold Courage mm-hmm. is... Uh, I do quite a lot of work in what's called Scandi Noir or with Scandinavian or Nordic countries. So the, you know, Finland, Sweden, Norway, that part of the world. And they're quite famous for shows like uh, Borgen and The Bridge and Wallander, sort of uh, crime, crime stories, essentially, a lot of them. And uh, they tend to be quite dark and twisty and, uh, you know, angst-ridden and, uh, 
a lot of things happen at night. <laughs> so that's that's a very popular genre. And uh, I was lucky enough that uh, I had worked with uh, some uh, Finnish producers at a company called Luminoir. Uh, and they were very keen on on going uh, internationally with with uh, this project rather than the, usually it would be you know, all shot in Swedish or Finnish and it would be like a local gem but they, they wanted to play in the, the world stage so therefore it was going to be in English so uh, uh, myself and one other writer uh, wrote the first season a, uh, a company called Viaplay who are fantastic uh, streamer company so if you can imagine something like sort of like Netflix for Scandinavia there's this little engine that could really doing amazing things in the Nordic region uh, so they backed it and uh, from them backing it then Lionsgate came on board and I was so impressed with the way Lionsgate worked the way through it every time there was a you know a problem to overcome or just the challenges of producing uh, they were there and hats off to them, a guy called Mark Lorber particularly. Um, and so from uh, Lionsgate then uh, both uh, co-producing and selling internationally. So it then sold to Britbox, which is a UK streaming service owned by the BBC and ITV, uh, 50-50. And from there, just in the last few weeks, uh, it's sold to uh, the US market uh, to AMC Plus, which is a fantastic place to be. So uh, the first episode's on, I think the first three episodes drop on, I think it's uh, March the 11th this year, 2021. Uh, so it's it's very twisty. You know, I, I hope that people will like it, but it's it's not necessarily... It's it's not necessarily your cup of tea if you're you know used to sort of plotty procedurals. It's it's much more dark. It's about current politics and uh, anyone who's lived through the last couple of years will recognise some of the characters in it. Um, so it's it's sort of ripped from the headlines if you like that that sort of world. And uh, I'm pleased that it's doing so well because it makes it easier to to uh, go on to make future ones. So with the same people, I'm just working on a fantastic thing, which is called The Man Who Died, which is uh, it's sort of in the vein of the Coen brothers. It's um, I won't spoil the plot, but uh, we're hoping to get that into production very soon uh, over the summer. And uh, so there's just a lot of a lot of stuff cooking uh, on that. And, and um, so, so I, I um, for all of our listeners, it's called Cold Courage. And also, I want to um quickly talk about you are an international judge for the Emmy Awards. Can you tell us how that came about? Yeah, I'm very proud of of judged it at a number of different levels. Uh, one of my favorite times was uh, doing the semifinals in uh, China, of all places. So that was a really interesting experience being surrounded by Chinese actors and directors uh, while judging uh, material from all over the world. At other times, you're simply watching watching at home and wading your way through through a lot of drama. And if j- just to, to end on the same point I started out, doing something special, while when you're wading through maybe 20 entries and you just have enough time to do it, then... If you get something really good, it just stands out head and shoulders above the rest. Uh, and you're so pleased as a, as a juror to be able to recommend it or pass it on to the next stage of judging uh, that you just want to hug whoever made it because you've seen, you maybe seen some of the others 14 times. Uh, so just do something fresh is, is what I would, my parting shot. Uh, and Brenda and Foley, where can they keep up with you? Do you have a Facebook page or? Uh, yeah, you can uh, say hi on Facebook or uh, there's a website, www.filmfoley.com. Uh, so, uh, yeah, welcome anyone saying hi. I don't don't always have time to send a fulsome reply, but I'll, I will gladly say hi to uh, anyone along the way. And if I can help, I will, because people, people helped me along the way too. And hopefully we'll continue to do so.
Oh, so thank you so much, Brandon Foley, for being here. Uh, Foley Films, right? Foley Films. Foley, yeah, I think it's Foley Film, just singular.